Hello everybody. So we're going to start off uh, by talking about soil formation. So how does soil form? What is the, what's the process and how does it come about? How do we end up with this nice picture that we have in the background here? So the first place to start is to talk about the uh, five factors of soil formation. So there's five determining factors. That's going to be your parent material, your topography, your climate, your organism, and your time. Um, it's not really, when we talk about soil formations, it's not going to be, you know, well, it's this one thing. So it's a, it's a parent material, and then it's a, it's a, you know, it's, this one's a parent material, this one's a topography dependent one. No, it's really the combination of these, of these five factors and, um, the differences that that makes all because because these can vary so much um especially your climate and then your your topography that variation produces the drastic differences we see in soils all over the place and what i mean by that is that we have so many different soils and we have so many soils um, just in this area that could differ and then you spread it out and, and you start seeing that there's all these different um, soils and then you go, you know, you look at what's happening here versus what's happening on another continent or at a different latitude and why is it so different? Well, it's these five factors. It's the idea of what what did it start from and then the topography is uh, how does it, how it does the actual relief, how does the the shape of it affect everything and then the the climate the temperature and the precipitation and then what's growing in it and what's moving around in it and what's what's making things work within it and then how long has it been there those are the five factors that really um, determine how our so how, what soil we have and how how that soil works so let's kind of look let's you know dig a little deeper so we have uh, the first one, parent material. So when we're talking about parent material, we're talking about the geologic material which the soils uh, form from. And so we're going to focus on um, the idea of igneous rocks, sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks, material deposited by ice, material deposited by water, material deposited by wind. Now, um, you can pause this video and take a look at the um, the lecture slides that go along with this with this uh, lecture, and um, click on the the video in the top right there that um, talks about the rock cycle and how um, rocks came to be. So go ahead, pause. All right, and back. And so, um, in terms of igneous rocks, we're talking about um, rocks that crystallize from molten lava. So granite, um, which it is the uh, parent material that's um, below uh, the Sierra Nevada mountains, that's um, that forms from igneous rock. Sedimentary rocks, so they're formed by the sedimentation of water. So the idea that you've got water and it constantly moves, and the movement of the water um, ends up forming um, forming the rock. You also have metamorphic rocks, so those. Um, they're formed by an alteration of uh, the igneous or sedimentary rocks under high temperature and pressure. So marble is a good example of a metamorphic rock that's formed by that alteration um, of under high temperature and pressure. So when we're talking about uh, material deposited by ice, so you're talking about something like glacial till. So the idea that um, that an area is frozen over and then slowly that area goes from frozen over to to no longer being frozen over. Um, you get moraine valleys um, up in the Rocky Mountains and in a lot of other places that were once covered by ice and, and now aren't covered by ice anymore. Material deposited by water, so alluvium is a good example of that. Uh, the Kern River. So basically the Kern River Valley, uh, when we look at the, um, the Kern River and, and the floodplain of the Kern River, that is mostly formed by alluvium, by the, the Kern River bringing that down from the, from the Sierras and working its way down, um, you know, through gravity. 
um, working its way out towards the ocean. So that um, the Kern River has basically brought alluvial deposits from the Sierras with it, and that's what the parent material for um, for the Kern for the Kern River and a lot of Bakersfield um, lower parts of Bakersfield are is is alluvium. And then um, material deposited by wind, so um, hard to pronounce sometimes. I think Los is the is the closest uh, pronunciation I can get. Uh, probably may have pronounced it wrong, but um, it's it's a hard word to pronounce. Uh, a good example of that is the lower uh, Mississippi uh, uh, alluvial valley. So. It's the lower Mississippi alluvial valley, so we just talked about alluvium. So the Mississippi River um, brings alluvium down, so that's how that, that valley gets formed. But then, um, actually, the hills um, in, in Mississippi, in the lower, uh, lower Mississippi alluvial valley, the hills are formed by, um, by wind deposits. So you actually, not necessarily the lower valley part, but the, you get these... Um, these bluffs and you get these almost uh, hills forming in Mississippi which there's um, if you if you know the southeast or you've been down there you know it's actually pretty flat for the most part and so what's kind of interesting is if you go to a place like like Natchez Mississippi or, or any of these places um, where you're going um, close to the river uh, you're, you're driving, you're driving and you're kind of up and then all of a sudden you, you drive down into, uh, the valley and, uh, you kind of sit there and go, wait a minute, this is, uh, flatland. How did, how did I all of a sudden drive down into the valley? And, um, and part of that is the, um, is the, the river doing it. But the other part of that is that the, the hills are being, um, uh, formed, the their lus hills being formed by um, the deposits of wind. Our second factor of soil formation is climate. So when we're specifically talking about climate, we're talking about temperature and precipitation. And when we're um, really focusing on the idea of t temperature and precipitation, I mean, we can just kind of make it real simple. We can, you know, is it is it hot? Is it cold? Is it hot, warm, or cold? Does it get um, no rain, no rain and snow, little bit of rain and snow, a lot of rain and snow? And just kind of think about it that way. And so how does that affect, um, how does that affect soil? Well, it's really, it's got a really big effect on the flora and fauna. So what plants and animals will be in that area? So uh, easy way to think about this, um, in a place, in places close to the equator, so lots of precipitation, and it's really warm most of the time. You basically get an unlimited growing season. So if I, if you have an unlimited growing season, you get more plants, and you get uh, you get um, you get more plants, and you get more animals because you have more plants. So if you have more plants, there's more things to eat. If there's more things to eat, then there's more things that are going to come eat those things, and then because we have a food chain. There's also bigger animals that want to eat those animals, and so all of a sudden we get more things. If we've got, um, if we've got an abundance of food, we're going to get um, abundance of animals. Uh, oppositely, uh, the opposite way to think about it is to think about the desert. Then, not a whole lot uh, of plants, so not a whole lot of food, which means not a whole lot of animals to be found. Another way that climate is influential. In terms of soil formation is the rate of mineral weathering and soil forming processes. So soils also weather much faster in in uh, warmer climates. So the the soil is going to going to change uh, much more in in a warmer climate. And and because of that, you um, you're also getting um, uh, changes in organic matter content which you can see there below and so you get um, you get things basically turning over quicker your rates of decay are, are super quick and um, and things just you know things hit the ground in in the um, in you know places in the tropics and they don't stay there very long you know a year or less and and it's gone it's into the soil and you're it's it's already you know working its way to become becoming something else 
Um, then we also can think about the ideas of um, evaporation and transpiration of water, or um, what a lot of people do is just combine those two terms to uh, be evapotranspiration. And when we're talking about evaporation, so just the idea of water um, evaporating, uh, becoming a, a, a vapor and, and going back into the hydrologic cycle. When we're talking about the idea of transpiration, that's the idea of the water, of the, the plant using the water and then, um, and then the water um, transpiring, becoming a water vapor and going back into the hydrologic cycle. So just kind of taking a, a, a quick, you know, <laughs> quick, small, small look at, a, at, you know, thousands of years of, of work. So you get, um, you start off with the bedrock, whatever parent material, um, well, you start off with bedrock. You start off with, you know, the earth's crust, basically just a hard layer of rock. And then you get weathering to happen. So whether that's um, the combination of wind and water or, or one or the other, that, you um, that bedrock turns into the skin disintegrating bedrock which then eventually becomes parent material which is just uh, really unconsolidated bedrock and you get the beginnings of organic matter uh, forming at the top and then as that happens you start it's you start getting this process to work from above and below because as the organic matter forms on the surface that organic matter then begins to start working its way down into into the parent material the parent material also is just then starting to weather more and more and so the soil layers will start to build um, from the bottom and so then you you see that you we get a c horizon here but we also have uh humus and we have an a horizon we start to have some plant material we get greater plant growth we now kind of get the formations of the horizons we get the a b and c horizons and we're we're looking good we're we're into having soil and how you know all it takes is just a few thousand years so in terms of organisms let me move myself right up here out of the way uh in terms of organisms uh we're talking about plants um which we also refer to sometimes as flora animals which we refer to as fauna and microorganisms uh, plants affect soil development by providing nutrients in organic matter. We kind of talked about that a little bit, um, but the idea that uh, that you've got uh, the the plant the plants, whether it's the roots or or the above ground material, um, then working its way, um, you know, hitting the soil and becoming part of that organic matter layer, develops into hum into humus and then works its way into into the soil. Uh, animals are going to affect decomposition rates and nutrient cycling um, just through their through their daily processes. Um, you know whether it's by um, by dropping scat or poop, or um, or um, their their role in the uh, in the nutrient cycling process, where you know how much of the above ground um, uh, biomass or even below ground. Um, are they are they uh, eating and then um, and then how much are they cycling back in um, into the the system um, whether it's through their their bodily processes or or what they're excreting out that sort of a thing they can affect the decomposition rates and then in terms of microorganisms microorganisms can influence aggregation so the actual way that the uh, soil binds on. To itself and the different um, the different ways that soil will bind together and the nutrient cycling in terms of nutrient cycling bacteria are dominant in soils under grassland or rangeland um, vegetation grass dominated vegetation whereas fungi are dominant under uh, forested vegetation and that's why in forest vegetations when we start talking about soil horizons you'll see that forest horizons have an e horizon which is, comes from the fungi generating organic acids, and that leads to um, leads to leaching, which um, which leads to an E horizon that shows up in forest soils, but not so much in grassland dominated soils. And that's just because of that difference between bacteria being in the grassland soils and fungi being in the uh, forested soils. All right. Here. I think I'll go up here 
this time, move to this corner. Whoa, there we go. All right, topography. So when we're talking about topography, we're really just talking about the shape of the land surface. And then um, specifically, the, the big thing with topography is how water is going to move in the landscape. So um, when we're talking about a water movement, you're definitely then talking about soil erosion, which is something um, we'll go into more detail later on in the class. But the idea of soil uh, moving from one place to another um, due to due to rain or water. Uh, so we see in this picture here on the left that um, at the top of this hill you get poor soils because you got a steep slope. You don't get good filtration into the soil and then water, if the water hits, the precipitation hits, you're mostly going to get um, water eroding your top soils. On the mid slope you're getting some average soils uh, you get some filtration, but and you get less erosion of topsoil. You're also getting a little bit of cumul accumulation of topsoil from the um, ground above. But on flatlands, you usually have great soils because you get great filtration. You get uh, a lot of the deposition of the soils from um, upslope um, down into the flatland, and so you get you get more topsoil, more organic matter, more of that good stuff that then works its way into the soils. Uh, and so that those sorts of little differences um, really can uh, make the different make a difference in what soils you have in the area. And then you start to think about that. On um, this is this is a really small example. Now start to think about what does it look like when you put in a whole mountain range, or the western United States versus the southeastern United States. So the southeastern United States is pretty much flat for the most part, but you, you go to the western United States and you've got the Rocky Mountains and you've got the Sierra Nevadas and you've got the Cascades and you've got the Coast Range. You've got all these different mountain ranges and then you've got the hills and then you've got, um, you've got all sorts of different changes in topography in the western United States versus the southeastern United States. So you're going to see a great difference in, in the soils and, and, what, and what can happen. And... Um, so you know this this small example here, if you kind of put that on a on a larger scale for where we are, start thinking about the idea of you know what what do soils on the Sierra Nevada on the Sierra Nevadas look like, and what do soils on the coast range look like, and then what about the central the central valley where you get all of that uh, this kind of this idea of great soils in the flatland area where you get all this deposition from uphill, and then you start thinking about um, if you know the history of the Central Valley well enough and the idea that ha it used to be um, more of kind of a, a swampy um, swampy area, then you start saying, well, okay, because we had all these big rivers and then the big rivers would bring all of this uh, material down and that would just sit in the valley. And you start thinking, you know, oh, well, how did this turn into this great huge farming area? And you start thinking about all these big rivers that then bring all this soil down and then you start really figuring seeing how something like topography can really shape um, how an area one area becomes one way but one area becomes different um, you also uh, can um, look at um, topography shaping things like depth to the water table and so um, the water table is just the idea of um, where where is the upper part of where you're going to find water in the ground. That's all we're saying. When we say the water table, we're just saying the top of where the water is um, underneath the ground. And so what is what is a lake? A lake is just means that there is a point where the water table is, the, the ground level is below um, the, the depth of the water table. So what do you mean? Well, I'm just all it is is the idea that the reason that the water it piles up above the land is because your water table is up here and your ground level is down here. Well, if that's the case, then the water is just going to flood the land until finally the land is above the water table. And then that's how you get a lake to form. And so it, that sort of a thing kind of then starts shaping our land too. So then how do you, you how do I get this area to look like this or... Or, you know, there's a, I might have a hill here, but then a depression here. So then I get soils up here, but then I also get this accumulation of water down here. And then how does that affect um, if, if this area then drains to a, a creek or a river, then 
Um, how does that affect the soils over here? And you start seeing how everything can start looking different and how just these five um, factors can really change the way that an area is going to look. You also get changes in lo um, localized changes, so smaller changes in moisture and temperature in different areas um, based on um, you know local local climate or local um, uh, effects. Um, so what what do I mean by that? So in terms of your uh, your topography, uh, especially here in California, the the topography combined with the climate can can create all sorts of um, different effects where you get little little microclimates. You know, area this area um, you get fog, but this area you don't. Um, you know, this area you get a little thermal belt at night, but this area you, you don't. And it, it all has to do with, with topography of your area plus the, the climate, uh, plus the climate in your area and the different little patterns that that can create. You know, whether you have um, a, you know, a small little valley, um, you know, something like, uh, like, you know, when you, when you're, uh, trying to hit the coast from from Bakersfield so you go down south and you've got that tiny little valley um, on the way to Ventura where you get Santa Paula and Fillmore and you and you look at something like that and that um, area has its own its own climate uh, and why does it have its own climate well because of the way that, that valley formed with the with the mountain ranges and just being this little strip in between the mountain ranges, it's going to be different than what is happening at the Central Valley because the Central Valley doesn't have that um, that influence of the coastal the coastal weather and the coastal climate um, that that valley does. And so it, it's little things like that that you're going to get um, differences as well. And then the idea of time and. You know, for me, I kind of almost don't want to have to explain time because I think uh, we all kind of get the idea. But I really like um, just trying to get people to understand because a lot of people sit there and go, well, how do we know, um, you know, how old the, the earth is and, and, you know, aren't we just guessing and all that sort of um, thing. And it's like, well, no, we're not really guessing because we know that there's things, studies have been done where... Um, we know because how long it takes to form soil. Well, so you start looking at how much soil we have underneath us. And if you look at something like it takes a hundred years to form an inch of topsoil. So an inch, for those of you that aren't um, used to just kind of, um, you know, what that kind of looks like, just think about the idea from the top of your thumb to your knuckle. That's about an inch for most people is close enough. So that much topsoil takes a hundred years. And now think about how much topsoil is in the ground. Now think about the fact that topsoil is only the top horizon um, in some places. Sometimes it's the O horizon. Sometimes it's the, the topsoil is the top horizon. But then there's also a B horizon and a C horizon and then that parent material. And then you start to think about how many years and add it up. And now you start thinking, okay, well now, you know, thousands of years, millions of years. And it's like, that's how long it's going to it, you know, that's how long it takes. And it really kind of blows you away a little bit when you start thinking about that. Um, but when we're specifically talking about time and soil formation, we're kind of talking about the idea of when the land surface was exposed uh, to when plants begin to grow. So this idea of um, when this weathering process started to happen, and then we've got plants growing and soil forming, and then we're, we're you know, getting to the point where we're going from bedrock to mature soil. And um, really, we, we want to focus on the idea of how long have the kind of the active soil formation factors, so uh, climate and vegetation, how, how long have they been acting on the parent material? And that's what we kind of think about when we think about um, time, is how long does it take when we start with this and then the weathering process starts to where we end up with this and all of these things happening in there and how long is that going to take and um, it's not going to be the same in all places because some places 
um, you start over you start over again and some places have a long time to develop and some places have um, have um, processes where they start over all the time uh, easy example of that is to think about Hawaii and um, the active volcano parts of Hawaii where you get an eruption happening and then you get molten lava covering everything and you have to start this process all over again in those areas and so it's really interesting to think about the idea that those areas get used to this kind of common process of starting this over again and you kind of start to see from scratch like how long is it going to take to to you know for things to work their way up and to build up um, on that versus uh, areas where you don't have um, a disturbance for a long long time and this stuff can just build and build and build and build And so what's the what's the point or why what's the significance of all this and the biggest thing is that it's going to determine the properties of your soil so um, changing the conditions of any one of those uh, five factors is going to result in a change in soil properties so if you get um, a change in the plant matter which is a thing that's kind of um, a common problem right now so the idea of you hear people talk about um, invasive species and so um, well what's 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 problematic about invasive species well there's all sorts of problems but one of the things to think about is that when those species are in the soil now as opposed to the native species that were there before that might affect um, a, or might make a difference in what kind of microorganisms are gonna um, be in the soil because maybe they they needed that native plant but now that plants not there maybe they have to move on to some somewhere else and now something else comes in there and then that changes um, and that'll start making changes in the soil you know if you get um, a change in in topography um, you know where we we do uh, that might happen a lot in urban areas you know well we need to um, you can think about something like uh, uh, the creation of a golf course where you know it might be a flat area but we don't want to just play golf on a flat area so we're going to create some hills and and bring in some dirt and you know build a build a hill here and then you know create a slope there and then overall um, then you start thinking about well what what's happening underneath how does that affect what what's going on underneath there now those sorts of effects you know we might see them quickly in some areas we might not see them quickly in some areas it depends um, this is a you know also ties into the big worries of climate change that people have in terms of the idea of with a changing climate how is that going to affect the soils how is that going to change the soils is that then going to change what type of plants grow in certain places or change um, the seasons and and all of these things that we're kind of used to you know these crops grow in the summer these crops grow in the winter well what if the the climate starts changing that kind of that'll affect all these sorts of things so it, it's really just the idea of realizing that you know well, we have kind of an idea of what's happening but then if we start changing a bunch of stuff that changes everything and we kind of have to start from scratch again and so that's the five factors of soil formation so now let's kind of talk about the soil forming processes so so what are the processes that make soil form slide myself back down here out of the way so we got physical weathering so weathering uh, itself is the is the wearing away of the surface of rock soil and mineral into smaller pieces so the idea that you just keep hammering it um, with water or wind and maybe it's a harsh thing or maybe it's just a a small thing um, you know just a drip 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 sort of a thing but just over and over and over again for hundreds and thousands and millions of years eventually gets gets things to change and form and look in different ways uh, wetting drying freezing thawing abrasion are all different ways that physical weathering can happening but the the biggest idea is just that we're going to break the rock into smaller particles um, that then also then can be tied into chemical weathering and um, that's kind of a, a important point is the idea that when we're talking about these soil formation processes just like we talked about the soil formation factors it's not really just going to be like a one thing well this this place was just physically weathered sometimes maybe but uh, most of the time it's a combination of factors as to how it forms and that's why we have so many different soils um, that that do different things 
So this is a look at the idea of uh, wave erosion. So the idea of waves and, you know, how does the beach or the coastline come to be? Well, you start thinking about this idea of the waves just constantly pounding against the rock and constantly pounding against the rock. And, you know, maybe it's not a big deal when you're out there and watching it, but imagine if you had to sit there and watch it for a million years, right? And if you say to yourself, oh, I can't even imagine that. Well, here, let's let's go to like a simple sort of thing. Just try and count in your head to a million. No, you wait, you don't want to do it. It's going to take too long. Yeah, you can you can sit there and you could actually go with a calculator. I've done, done it um, a few times and you sit there and you calculate how long it would take you if you if you could count a second. If you count one number every second and you just kept going and you tried to count to a million, how long? it would take you. It's a long time. So imagine what that actually looks like in time. If you're actually this rock and you're just getting pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded for over and over and over again. And eventually this stuff gives way. I mean you think of rock and you think of it being solid but eventually it's going to give way. Uh, your softer, weaker rocks are going to give way first. Your harder, more resistant rocks get left behind. That's how you end up with something like here on the left where you start getting um, these kind of holes that form, but yet the other parts are kind of holding off. Uh, it can take over 100 years to erode a rock to sand, and then the energy of the waves and the chemical content of the water um, continues to erode the coastline. You also get a similar effect in rivers or creeks or... or um, or just water erosion in general, where you get the fast running water, it causes rocks to hit one another and, and break into smaller rocks. So that's kind of the idea of abrasion, is when they be um, uh, other rocks hitting other rocks and causing them um, to, to break apart. Uh, you can also just get it to where the water is working its way. So if you're talking about like the freezing or, or um, thawing or any of that sort of stuff. Water works its way into the pores of the rock and then gets in there and can, um, you know, freeze in there and that can, um, you know, force the rock to kind of split apart or um, other processes where you just start chipping away you know, piece by piece at the rock. Chemical weathering. So in chemical weathering, uh, you got uh, just the basic idea, and we'll cover this in later chapters, but the idea that Soil is mainly is composed mainly of minerals, and rocks are solid mineral compounds. And minerals are only stable under, or minerals are, sorry, minerals are only stable under the conditions, uh, which they in which they originally formed. So what does that mean? So the idea that the minerals um, that you start off with, and there's like uh, eight, eight basic minerals, and we'll, co um, we'll cover that. But the idea that they're stable and they kind of stay the same way that they are is if if the temperature and the pressure that they were formed under stays the same. If that changes at all, and we know that temperature changes um, all the time, then you're, the minerals uh, can change. And that's where you get this chemical transformation of rock into new compounds. And so you can have silicate minerals um, being transformed into insoluble materials that remain in the soil. Now, once they're in the soil, they can be used by the plant or they can leach through the soil and um, work their way down um, into uh, other layers into the soil. So if we look here, so some of the things we talked about um, before, so the idea of just kind of physical weathering, we get this surface erosion where um, we get uh, we get the the just the idea of um, of uh, wind wind erosion or water erosion happening, and then over here we get water and carbon dioxide and organic acids infiltrating the rocks along fractures, and they're causing this chemical weathering. So the the water water erosion kind of starts off the process, and then that allows CO two and organic acids and these other um, these other um, other things that have minerals in them to then work their way into the soil and then start um, changing changing things around um, to try and keep it simple and not try and uh, get too complicated with it. Another look at it, so um, in this case water again penetrates uh, extensively jointed rock, chemical weathering, 
deposes minerals and enlarges these joints. Rocks are attacked more on corners and edges. And then, um, then we have spheroidal weathering happening where um, you basically, um, because the weathering attacked the edges, because the edges are weak spots, you get this more square thing that becomes a little more rounded and then eventually you end up, you've rounded it off uh, completely. And then this is an example from Joshua Tree National Park. Now this is also happening over a long period of time. So, you know, once again, thousands and millions of years sort of a thing. So it's, it's time is super important, but you can go from, you know, what looks solid to, um, you know, pieces of, of things that look solid. You can also have leaching. So leaching is the removal of materials in uh, solution from a soil. And we'll go uh, into detail about what a solution is, but basically the idea that you've got uh, minerals um, that need to be um, in um, in water to be active, to be able to be um, taken up by, by plants. Um, usually this ha happens with percolated precipitation. So the idea of having precipitation and water and then the water um, pushes things down through the soil. Um, some compounds can be actually leached all the way out of soil um, and just kind of work their way all the way, all the way out. So how does it work? You get heavy rainfall. You have your organic soil horizon release nutrients that because they um, because they get the water, the water creates the solution. Then they work start working their way down through the the soil. Um, through the process of decomposition by soil microorganisms, so the little organisms start doing their job. Nutrients dissolve into the soil water between um, individual soil crumbs, so they start working their way through the soil. If you get really porous soil, dissolved nutrients keep moving down the soil column as the soil drains, and then nutrients can be translocated um, into the soil column as the soil drains. So you can have it to where they just move down, or they can also be moved um, um, through the soil depends on um, what you've got uh, going on down there, how soluble it is, how much percolation you have happening. All those sorts of things will determine how much leaching you have. Uh, accumulation of organic matter. So organic matter is going to accumulate as your plants grow. In forests, basically just think about the idea of leaves and twigs falling. Whereas rangeland or grasses, you're going to have a fibrous root system where some of that uh, fibrous root system is going to die every year. And so in forests, because you're talking about leaves and twigs, um, you're really going to actually um, end up with a thinner layer. It's going to be a thin, dark layer. And it's going to be a thin, dark horizon over a leached horizon. And remember that leached horizon happens because forests have um, are made up of mostly fungi uh, underneath them as opposed to bacteria in the in the grass systems. So in the rangeland systems though you got a fibrous root system where some of it's going to die every year and so you're going to end up with actually this thick dark surface horizon because you don't have that leaching happening as much so you get much more of an accumulation of a thick um, surface horizon of organic matter. 